Influencing popular culture, politics, and everything in between. The local station takes you ringside as we discuss the crazy world that is professional wrestling. This is Going Ringside with the local station. Hello there, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Going Ringside. I'm your host, Scott Johnson, and boy, do we have a packed show for you today. But before we talk about it, I want to talk about last week's episode. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, go check it out in the archives right now. We were joined by Brutus the Barber Beefcake, Brother Bruteye, uh, the Booty Man, and Zodiac also in WCW are some of his names. Go back and check him out right now. Great interview. Talks about some interesting things about Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff. You'll want to hear what he has to say about Shawn Michaels and some of the stuff that he and Hogan did. Good stuff back with Brutus Beefcake. You want to go check it out right now. Great episode in the archives right now. Today, we've just got a packed show. First and foremost, if you saw the thumbnail to click on this show on YouTube or our website, newsforjacks.com, or wherever you get it, you probably saw we've been invaded by macho men. The most uh, macho man impersonators, I think, in one video ever. And we're going to have it in a bit coming up. We're also going to lead the show in a bit uh, with a, a writer from the New York Post, Joseph Stacheski, who uh, wrote a very intriguing piece about AEW and WWE in the New York Post recently, got the wrestling internet world talking. His title of his article is WWE Needs to Look in the Mirror After AEW's uh, Star-Studded Free Agency Hall, talking about Mercedes Monet, Okada, Will Ospreay. So we're going to have him join us in just a little bit. And then, Wes, we talk about these macho man professional impersonators, these fans. At the end of the show, we're going to have an author who just wrote a great book you want to check out and stay uh, tuned for it. The name of the book is called For the Love of the Show, Pro Wrestling Fans Tell Their Stories. Um, it was written by a guy whose first venture into um, writing so it is Jeremy Housewright is his name and it's a good book and we're going to talk to him all about it and just the unique profile of what it's like to be a wrestling diehard fan in the modern era so we're going to have him coming up uh, at the end of the show so don't miss out it's a great interview and you'll want to hear it but before we get any further if you clicked on the link for this show you probably saw the image like you won't see anywhere else we were flooded with macho men a little later in the show, we are going to have all the Macho Man professional impersonators from around North America join us here on the podcast uh, right after we talk to the reporter from New York Post. Now, to give you a little bit of a tease, I just pulled this clip before we started recording, before we started the interview officially, all these guys jumped on the Zoom call with me. There was so much macho-ness on this show, all these Macho Men uh, in total character, uh, just to give you an example of what it was like, I just want to show you this quick clip of before the interview even started, me just trying to mount, uh, manage all these characters who were just exuding Macho Man out of every pore. Watch this quick clip. We'll have the full interview a little later on. Guarantee every one of you do. I know it. Dig it. Ooh, yeah. yeah I'm watching, I'm watching yes, every right. one of you. Got it. Yeah. We're missing you know one guy. guy. Eyes for Elizabeth. Just yeah, my name. Just my name real quick. Okay. You have eyes for Elizabeth. You face me one on one. The Macho Man, Randy Savage. Yeah, think it. Just to give everybody a quick heads up. Yeah, there is always one in the crowd, and usually it's me. Dig it. Oh yeah. So to clarify, that wasn't even the interview. They just hopped on the call and just started going. I'm trying to manage it, and you've got so much macho madness going on. Kind of difficult to manage. You'll want to hear the whole interview. They talk about their problems with Hulk Hogan, if he had lust in his eyes, and um, they will talk about what it's like to be macho man in front of their families. They will talk about snapping into a Slim Jim and everything else macho man. Stay tuned for that. It's a great uh, one-of-a-kind interview. Never been done before, but we did it here on Going Ringside a little later. That's your tease. It gets a little crazier than the quick clip you just saw. That was just me setting the guys up. 
That wasn't even the real interview. Um, but before we get to that, uh, we brought in Joseph Stachewski. He's a writer for the New York Times. He does a lot of wrestling articles, not New York Times, excuse me, New York Post. New York Post, does a lot of wrestling articles for the New York Post, Joseph Stachewski. So he joined me on the show today because he wrote this um, just last in the last couple weeks. Last week it came out. WWE needs to look in the mirror after AEW star-studded free agency hall. His premise of the article is, you know, there's all this stuff going on with WWE and the build-up to Mania, but they just signed Will Ospreay, Okada, Mercedes Monet, formerly Sasha Banks, huge names in the wrestling world. It means something for AEW and possibly as they go head to head with WWE in this critical year of 2024. So wanted to bring him on the show, pick his brain about why he feels this way, why he feels WWE needs to look in the mirror. So here's my interview with New York Post wrestling reporter, Joseph Stachewski. Joseph, thanks for joining us on the show today. Great to be here. Talk to me a little about your column here um, on AEW's free agency, um, you know, versus WWE. What are your thoughts on that? That, I mean, they've kind of been quietly doing this with everything going on with The Rock and everything right now. Um, my point of the column was more to kind of say that, especially now with this like free agency period, you know, there were three pretty much big names out there. It was Okada, Osprey, and Mercedes Monet. If you like, if you looked at the Free agency list; those three were were at the top, um, and you know AEW was able to bring all three of them in. It was, it was more kind of a, a look at, you know, why did this why did this happen? Why did why did they end up, you know, here? And everybody had has, you know, kind of varying degrees or varying um, reasons for why that happened. Um, you know, Osprey he gave him a chance uh, to live in the UK and still still wrestle. I mean, he's commented and saying, you know, the, the pay was better and the schedule was better. You know, Kata has a great relationship with the Young Bucks, and I'm sure that played, you know, a role. And and Mercedes is a chance to to, to be a, 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 the face of this division, which, you know, probably may or may not have happened in WWE. I mean, she's done that already there in, in many ways. What do you think AEW the draw is? I mean, Tony Khan is not as constrained by corporate or, you know, publicly traded interests that, uh, you know, WWE is. Do you think that has something to do with it? I saw in the article you likened a little more to what WCW was doing when they were, you know, drawing guys over in the 90s. The WCW comparison was more more pay and, and, um, and schedule. Like, you're getting paid a pretty good amount to be an AEW, and, you know, you're not working that weekly house show schedule that you would have to work if you were in WWE. You know, it's a grind on people. Well, and I said that that's something that allows someone like Osprey or other people to to maybe not have to move completely stateside to to work. Um, you know, obviously, there's probably a lot more, not a lot more. But there's a different level of creative freedom in AEW than would be in WWE, just from the sheer sense that one's a PG program and one, you know, really isn't. Or not isn't, but one is less. There's times where it crosses that you know line into the hardcore matches and things like that that you wouldn't normally see on. You know, WWE TV. I had Paul um, White on the show, uh, formerly the big show, a little while back. Um, and he was essentially saying to me, you know, WWE in the Vince McMahon era when he was there was, you know, very corporate. You know, you had to do what you want to do. And then the AEW brand is a little more a family owned company where you're working with Tony. Do you see that as a viewer? That, you, I mean, you say you saw more flexibility in what a character can do. Uh, you know, I don't know about flexibility, what a character can do. It, it may be a little more, um, maybe personal control over what your your ca- character can do. Obviously, there's you know they, there's less writers in WWE, there's less writers in AEW than there are in WWE. Uh, um, you know, they're they're not getting handed a, a script sometimes. Uh, that's not the case with every WWE performer. It kind of depends upon where you are and and the trust that they have in you. Um, I don't know if it's the so much the 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 corporate thing. I think it's just um, I'm trying to think of a way to say it. I think the point more was more. Um, sorry, I'm kind of a little off topic. Um, no, I understand. But yeah, I mean, um, go ahead. Just ask that again. Well, um, I mean, do you think there's more flexibility know, know much- for talent? 
Uh, there is obviously flexibility in, in your schedule and being able to work with outside companies too. Um, you know, obviously AW has that relationship with New, De New Japan has started the relationship with CMLL. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in WWE, you you work for WWE. Um, they've gone out of that a little bit, you know, recently. Obviously, you Shana mentioned, you mentioned working... that in the article that there was a guy who worked with Muda a little in Japan. Sting got to work. Oh, I mean, uh, Shinsuke Nakamura got Nakamura, to work on one of Muda's yeah. last matches in, in, in Japan. Um, Shane is going to get to work in you know, Josh Barnett's Bloodsport. Um, obviously, those are somewhat special cases because Shayna has a great relation. Uh, it was trained by Josh Barnett. You know, I think Triple H is, is, I think it's been set out that Triple H has a pretty good relationship with him. And obviously, WWE has a great relationship with Muda. He's he's in their Hall of Fame, <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, but yeah. there's obviously a lot of greater flexibility as far as being able to work in different promotions when you're, you know, kind of in AEW. The premise of the article was WWE could learn something here. I mean, what could they take away from it? It wasn't so much learn. It was more, okay, here's the things that AEW can present the talent. A lighter schedule, you know, especially at the top level, probably similar or, or more pay, um, greater freedom to, to, to work in other companies. So if that's going to be some of the things that, that they can offer and you weren't able to land some of these three individuals here, obviously it's a, everything on a case-by-case -case basis, but... Do you have to look at the way you approach some of these free agency and your strategies and what do you offer so that when this opportunity comes up again, there you have a different approach to how you're doing things? Or are you going to, you know, kind of stick with what you're doing? And if they want to come to WWE, then then great. And if they don't, they don't. And like I said, there, WWE doesn't have to doesn't have to bring in all these big name talents. They They have plenty on their roster. They have the developmental system in NXT and the performance center that Pretty much outside of you know New Japan having the dojo, like there, nobody else has that the ability to take a college athlete and turn them into a, and teach them how to be a pro wrestler. I mean, we're seeing it with with, with the Creed brothers, you know how good they are. Um, it was more a look at like, hey, if, you know, we're going to go down this path, and there's going to be some things that AEW can do and offer. C can we offer that to other people? Can we change or offer different things? Like, how do we go about our strategy in these situations when it comes up again? Where do you see it going from here? Do you think, uh, I mean, I'm personally of the opinion, Mania sucked up a lot of the oxygen in the wrestling world and the buildup to it with The Rock. Do you think long-term the signings of a Monet, of an Okada, are going to start to really pay dividends for AEW here? I think it can. W will it? We'll see. I mean, one of the arguments, you know, um, not against, but one of the maybe negative arguments against an Okada and an Osprey are they're not really known to the, American audience. They've been wrestling yeah. in Japan for all, all those years. So it's going to take a little bit of time for them to, you know, get maybe well known over here or get the audience used to them. Monet, she has, you know, the built in WWE recognition. She has the, you know, the Star Wars. She has the ability to be a star right away and maybe be helpful in TV negotiations. Um, Osprey has all the potential in the world. I mean, we see it week in and week out. You know, in the last couple of weeks with him, of, of what he could become, um, it's going to be interesting to see. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the ratings if it helps with ticket sales in the sense that hey, there's three new big attractions here that you can come see when you come see AEW. Two of which ha don't haven't wrestled stateside, you know, at this level for for a number of years. I mean, that was one thing in the in back columns that I had about AEW that it just felt like. There wasn't anything kind of fresh or new to see. Some of the, um, you know, some of the acts were kind of the same, but we've obviously seen a change in the Young Bucks that was big. And now you have these three other, you know, commodities that the at least the AEW fan is going to be pumped to see. Do you feel they'll have success? Like, you know, there's debate on did Adam Copeland have success when he came in? You go, you know, you said some, some people th say he was a great signing. Others say it, it's kind of fallen flat. Do you think uh, in Okada or a Monet will continue to generate buzz each week? I think you'll see Monet do it, I think, slowly. I think it's more in the sense that she can have a ripple effect, hopefully, on the women's division, where you start putting her in these segments with, with Julia Hart and Sky Blue, and now they're part of things with her, and now it shines a light on, on those women uh, 
to maybe some of her followers that, or some of the people that have follow her that don't know who Julia Hart and Sky Blue are. Um, I think we saw it a little bit this week where they did, you know, she, start, she started off two straight shows. She's gotten a live promo in two straight shows. They did the angle last week, and then they even followed that back up with like a backstage segment to further the angle. So now you're getting a little more depth of story. You're getting a little more, you know, uh, camera time for the women because she's there. I think that effect is is going to be, you know, something that I think is equally a lot more easier to to monitor kind of week by week as you start seeing her interact, you know, more and more. One other question: um, you said you said you felt that they. AEW is able to offer the same or similar money to WWE. Do you think Tony Khan continues to have that financial ability to do that as the years go by? I mean, I don't know Tony's finance. I mean, we all know what, you know, Tony's family is worth. We don't you know. We don't know what we don't really see the AEW books. We don't know. Um, the biggest thing is going to be the TV deal. You know, if that TV deal is what it can be what it, what it probably should be then it will definitely allow him to to continue on that path i mean that's really the biggest thing if it, if it falls short you know then it's probably more of his money that's going to have to be that's going to be spent you know um and i said that's that's the question for i think that can be better answered once we know what their television deal is sure and i talked to tony a couple months ago and he said there will be one we'll land somewhere but he yeah. wouldn't really say where yet, and he—they don't really know. I don't know that anyone does, except maybe him by now. I think with um, I think someone said it or or wrote it a couple of weeks back that I think that maybe it was Meltzer that it may have to wait till after the NBA deals are done because that's probably um, top priority for Warner Brothers Discovery right now, um, and it probably helps to know where their finances are once yeah. they figure out how much they, they're going to pay for NBA rights, which you know obviously. You know, in the grand scheme of things, about as important as NFL, or right up there with the NFL and Major League Baseball, and, and making sure you secure those. Got it. Well, Joseph Stachewski, New York Post. Thanks for joining us on the show today. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, you. So I want to thank Joseph for coming on. Uh, great article he has up on the New York Post. If you want to go check it out right now, um, specific publishing date was March nineteenth. If you want to go find it. Um, also got to talk about the guys we have on the show today. We're going to certainly change Tony here from, you know, serious business discussion to total madness. And we're talking macho madness. I uh, put out on the uh, Going Ringside Instagram and TikTok channel saying, because in Marvel had that Doctor Strange movie they called Multiverse of Madness. Because multiverse, you have all these different ver variations of the same person. Well, the true multiverse of madness, I think, is now here at Going Ringside. So I was talking to a professional Macho Man impersonator, Macho Verse, out of New York City a few months back. He cut a promo here on the show. And when I was talking to him, he said to me something that struck me. He goes, I'm the Macho Man of New York. I'm like, wait a minute. Expand on that. Well, apparently there's Macho Men, professional impersonators, all over the country, all over North America, throughout the U.S. and Canada. So I'm like, well, do you all want to come on the show at once? And they said, we absolutely do. So this is your chance to see more macho-ness on one screen than in the history of mankind. Right here, from coast to coast, from continent border to continent border, all across North America, the macho men have descended on going ringside and here is our interview with macho men from all over the U.S. and Canada. This is the most macho Zoom call in the history of mankind. Macho mans, macho men, say hi to our viewers right now. Okay, I, 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 I got to pull an Earl Hefner and quiet it down. So we can go one at a time. There's so much macho on this call. I don't know what to do with it. This is amazing. Let me start with Macho Mids out in California. Macho Mids, how did you get into this world of becoming the Macho Man? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you about it. One day I was approached by the Council of Macho. Wanted to know if I would join their ranks. I had to go to a super secret meeting. 
where I was quizzed and questioned on my macho man knowledge. Then I was given the key to the macho kingdom. Yeah, freak out. Freak out, freak out, macho man, Nova Scotia. If you could yeah. come up, one thing I've been told not to talk about, but I'm going to do it anyways, is yeah. Hulk Hogan. Hulk is there still some tension there with you and the Hulkster? What? Hulkamania, yeah. There is nobody that does it better than a macho man. But I know it, and everybody else knows it, yeah. We stand there and we watch Hulk Hogan. Bust in his eyes for Elizabeth, yeah. And then he sits there with his grandstanding and his hot dog and staring at the macho man. He need, yeah. He needs an elbow, and that's exactly what he's gonna get from the cream, yeah. The cream of the crop, because no one does it better than the macho man Randy Savage, yeah. Dang macho, it. Ma macho man Edmonton, you are up next. Macho man Edmonton, did Hulk Hogan truly have lust in his eyes for Elizabeth? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think he did, yeah, yeah, and I will not put up with that, no, I will not put up with that, no, yeah, I will crush that punk, yeah, yeah, because he thinks that he has 24-inch pythons, yeah, but I've got the pretty pythons, yeah, yeah, and he's a punk, yeah! Macho Man Arizona. Macho Man Arizona, it wasn't always Miss Elizabeth. You had Sherry Martell, Queen Sherry with you. Who is better? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Queen Sherry or Elizabeth? After, ooh, yeah, that's a tough subject. Yeah, Miss Elizabeth, the greatest there is. There was, you know, she was my first and my last. But then she came and she went with Hulk Hogan, the pukesters. She turned her back on the macho man. Sherry had my back. And Macho Man Ontario, one of the big things that happened in your career is you got called into the NWO. Why did you go into the NWO, Macho? Oh, yeah, the tides were turning, yeah, and I just felt the colors of the black and white, yeah, they were just embracing the madness, and yeah, and there was only one way to go, and that was the NWO for life, brother, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Dig it. Macho Man Texas, when you were in the NWO, there were guys like Hall and Nash who were just running roughshod over you for a while. What did you think of those guys, Hall and Nash, in the NWO? Ooh, yeah, on a personal level, I love But like, yeah, the business talk, yeah. They got a little jealous of the Macho Man Randy Savage, dig it? Yeah. And Macho Texas, I got to interrupt you. I haven't talked about you're the king. You've got the Ooh, crown. There were yeah, a lot of kings. Snake skin, yeah. There were a lot no, of kings. There was, there was Duggan. There was Haku. There was Harley Race. Is the Macho King the greatest king of all time? Macho King is without a doubt, yeah. You heard it once. You heard it twice. You heard it three times. The Macho King is the best of the best, yeah. Macho Verse and New York City Macho Man. You had a long kind of on again, off again relationship with the ultimate warrior. What was it like working with the ultimate warrior? It was absolute total mental insanity. Yeah. That guy was on when he was on, he was off when he was off. Yeah. Uh, things are just turning around. And I think the momentum is kicking in. Yeah. The ultimate maniacs. Yeah. Uh, you think you know us, but you don't. Yeah. Macho Alpha Magnus. I don't even know what to ask you. I see Ultra Magnus the Transformer combined the love child of the Macho Man and Ultra Magnus the Transformer. Tell me all about this. I am uh, the uh, resident mashup guy. I do many a mashups all across the universe, through the stars, funky like a monkey and such like that. Um, I did the Macho Mandalorian. I've done shazam into a slim gym i'm all over the place you never know where i'm coming so is uh is 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 hulka megatron you're hulk hogan i mean what's the deal here who are you feuding with yeah yeah that uh hogan tron whatever you call it 
that a hot shot, boot scooting, son of a gun. He ain't got nothing. He got a crutch trigger, and we all know it. He's old. Mach- Macho Man Florida. I want to ask yeah. you about today's wrestlers. You've had, there's a lot of wrestlers like The Rock, John Cena. They say Seth Rollins is the new Macho Man. Are they as good as the Macho Man was? Uh-huh. No, listen, no one can ever be as good as the Macho Man was. Yeah, these punks don't go nothing on the Macho Man. They can't hang in the ring. They can't hang out of the ring. They can't hang nowhere with the Macho Man. Uh-huh, dig it. Comparatively Mach- speaking to the Macho Man, they're nothing but garbage, yeah. Garbage, uh-huh. They yeah, well, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. No garbage. Macho Mid's out in California. You're out in public like that. What is it like when people see you out in public? Oh, yeah. Well, today I am at the Arizona Renaissance Festival. Yeah, so I am Renaissance man Randy Savage. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of fans of the NWO and the WWE out here in the middle realm. Yeah, and we're going all the way to the top for the cream of the Renaissance crop. Yeah. Macho Man Nova Scotia, yeah. do you have a family, and what do they think of your uh, your lifestyle? Do I have a family? Yeah. My parents and my sisters absolutely love it. I actually went to Nova Scotia just to promote my sister's uh, little yard sale thing she has there. Some lady come and she took a video and that's one of the first ones that actually got like quite a few views on it. I was like shocked. Everybody over uh, Nova Scotia seen it and I was like, what? What happened there? Yeah. Everybody, my friends and my family, they think I'm crazy, but they know what's up. Yeah. They actually 100% dig it. Macho Man Edmonton. How long does it take to get the macho-ness ready from your maybe regular day-to-day life to where you become fully macho? Not too long. Yeah, yeah. It's like a cup of coffee in the big time. Yeah, yeah. I just put uh, this sexy bandana. I already have a beard. I got the Swiss Alpinas over there. Yeah. And I have the body already. Yeah, hard work in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Macho Man, Arizona. I want to ask you, Macho was part of Baywatch with the Hulkster on one of the most popular TV shows on the planet. What was the lot? And you've done acting. You were in the Spider-Man movie. Why? uh, Why was Macho Man so popular in Hollywood? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Nobody does it better than the Macho Man. Nobody. Hands down. That's as good in the north, south, east and west. Yeah. Now, Macho Man Ontario, what is it like when you go out in public? Talk to me about responses you get from any uh, Macho Madness maniacs. Oh, yeah, well, uh, the older folks here, like, the, they seem to know what I'm doing. Yeah, they dig it. Yeah, the younger folks, they, they think I'm a little cuckoo. Yeah, a little cuckoo in the cuckoo's nest. Dig it. Yeah, but... uh. I still get a lot of pictures and make a few tits. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh-huh, yeah. I think we got, uh, we lost one. The Macho Man Texas, are you still on here? Yeah, I'm still okay, here. Okay, Macho yeah. Man Texas, what is it? How did you guys all get to know each other? How did that oh, work? Oh, yeah. I got to say it was from Brandon Savage. Yeah. Introduced me to the Macho Council. Yeah. Macho verse out in New York City. Yeah, if I, um, can that a little bit. Uh, I see you guys out a lot with other wrestlers. Uh, I see uh, Dusty Rhodes. I see Mick oh, Foley. I see The Undertaker. But it oh. seems the one that everyone wants to dress up the most as is the Macho Man. Why is that? Oh, yeah, because the Macho Man is the cream of the crop and nobody does it better. Yeah, if I could just add, Scott Stir, uh, you know, this all got together because we were trying to go live one day at the idea of Brandon Savage, the Macho Man from Vice, Dark Side of the Ring, uh uh-huh. And then we couldn't get our schedules to align with the universe, so we started started a group chat and we've never been able to get together live until now. Yeah, so Scott, you're turning the pages of history right now. History, Becky! Kings the Macho Man. Oh, oh, the macho yeah. Man Ultra Magnus. Where does that costume arrive? I mean, where can people see Macho Ultra Magnus? 
And Macho Magnus, you'll need to unmute yourself. I know technology for Transformers is tough. Go ahead. Sorry, I bump into things with these shoulders. Uh, I, uh, I'll i be at TFCon, actually, in a couple months, and uh, Rathacon at the end of this month, or beginning of this month, uh, April. But I, I, I go to mostly Transformer conventions like this. And Macho Man Florida, before we go to all of you, let me close with you. Talk to me about why you think Macho is still popular in 2024 when he was, you know, on top of the world in 1984 to 94. Yeah, listen, the Macho Man is eternal. The madness is always going to be around as long as you've got people like this keeping it alive, you know. We just try to honor him, keep him alive, keep him out there in the universe. And he'll always be there because of the colors, because of the madness, because he's just too sweet. Uh-huh. Yeah, dig it. Okay, and Macho the Man, goes before we go. Goes yeah. Too sweet to be sour. Tower of power. Yeah, yeah man. Everyone on mute. Let's give a final promo. Yeah. Final promo for ooh, the viewers. Go yeah. ahead. Can we do an ooh, ooh yeah all at the same yeah. time? Give me an ooh, ooh yeah, yeah all at the same time. In one, one, one two, three. Two, three. Ooh, ooh, just a Fully in a position yeah. that we'd Do rather not yes. do it. Uh -huh. so, man, every man wants to be a macho man. Oh my goodness! This is the greatest dream it would be. Macho man, thank you for joining us today. Go out and uh. Go find him. Don't go. Too much, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. Before we go. Who's all got a cheers to a, a slim gym? Give me a slim gym. Who's got a slim gym? Cheers. Slim gym's ready. Snap and do a slim gym. Cheers. Who's on the list? Yeah. Who's slim gym? Yeah. 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 I can't believe they paid me to do this. How did I get this job? This was awesome. Uh, yeah, we all, so I wrap it up there and I'm like, oh crap, we didn't talk about a Slim Jim. Let's back it up and snap into it. So that was the, I think maybe the only time in history that much macho-ness has been in one place. Share it, tell your friends, tell everyone you saw it here on Going Ringside, uh, all the macho men in one place how you like that? Uh, I've been wanting to get that for several months. We finally did, so I was so excited to have all the macho men in one place. Share it with your friends. Share it with any macho maniacs out there. We th This was the true multiverse of madness here on Going Ringside. So we were so excited to get them here. Um, and on this issue of fans, diehards, like what you just witnessed there in the macho-verse, uh, you know... There is this subculture of fans that a lot of America is just not, or North America is not really just aware of that exists out there. So one guy decided to document it and he wrote an entire book about it. Dr. Jeremy Housewright wrote this book, For the Love of the Show, Pro Wrestling Fans Tell Their Stories. He's uh, been in touch with fans like what you just saw, that type of fan, all over the country to write a very intriguing pro wrestling book that just came out. So I want to get to it right now. Here's our interview with author Jeremy Housewright on his new book, For the Love of the Show. Well, we're joined now by Jeremy Housewright, an author from the Midwest who just wrote a new book titled For the Love of the Show. Jeremy, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. Well, tell me all about this. This is a, this is a book about kind of wrestling fans, so to speak. Yes, sir. Uh so I travel around the country covering WWE, AEW shows. And, um, you know, in my travels, I've gotten to meet several new friends uh, who have become very close friends of mine. And we talk daily through text and uh, get together once or twice a year at some of these shows. You know, WrestleMania in New York, we got together, uh, we got together in Las Vegas for a show. So in my travels, I've I detailed my experiences uh, talked a little bit about myself growing up, uh, how wrestling impacted me. And uh, then I thought, you know, my story is kind of unique, but there's got to be other people out there with stories that are even more off the wall or more inspiring. So I uh, kind of searched around the country and I found six different wrestling fans with great stories to tell. And, uh, you know, I, that's how I came up with the book. 
I want to know your backstory. So I'm looking behind you right now. Sorry, I got to look off camera to see. I see no holds bar poster. I want to say that's Ronda Rousey above you, possibly. Hard to tell. Talk to me about your fandom and how that started before we get into the book. So my fandom started at the age of six years old. I'm now 42. And uh, the only other thing that I am more passionate about than wrestling is Kansas City Chiefs football. And, uh, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at six years old, my grandfather started taking me to WWF uh, house shows here in St. Louis at the old Keel Auditorium. And, and St. Louis is just a historic city for wrestling. Yes, sir. Yes, Is it that is. where um, Harley Race was kind of centered in yes, St. Louis? Yeah, yeah, he actually has a, his son now runs his wrestling school in Troy, Missouri. Oh, really? Okay, small world. Yes. I did not know that. Interesting. Yep. So you start in St. Louis in, in the golden era, it sounds like. Yeah, I was a huge Hulk Hogan fan growing up. Yep. Uh, you know, I would watch every time he was on TV, uh, any pay-per-view, you know, WrestleMania he fought at. Uh, I would, you know, try to get my parents to buy it or I would wait till the uh, videotapes came out and I would run up to the video store and and get those and and watch them. So yeah, Hulk Hogan was my guy. So if you started in at six years old in the latter half of the 1980s, I'm assuming you're coming of age in the Attitude Era. Yes, sir. What was it like to be a teenager when that starts? <laughs> you know, um, all I you know I can remember videotaping or you know recording them on my VCR uh, and coming home and watching them and uh, going to school and talking to the other students about it that is when it was uh you know first became cool to be a wrestling fan everybody had their stone cold steve austin 316 sure. t-shirts their dx t-shirts i can remember going to sporting events and uh you know giving uh you know the opponents the the dx suck it sign and sure. getting in trouble <laughs> and, i was uh, wondering if you were one of those kids who got in trouble in school for dx and i'm actually a teacher now so that's, <laughs> that's kind that's of funny that's ironic that's ironic um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I loved in, in high school. That was that was the thing. Every Monday night, sure. we would all watch it and we'd come to school Tuesday and, uh, you know, say, did you see that? I can't believe they did this on TV or said this. And, uh, you know, it was it was a time that will never happen again in pro wrestling. Yeah. And uh, I don't think it could happen again. I think the the censors would have a heyday with it. Uh, yeah. You know, and, you know, I'll say this, knowing now what um, you know, the, the new information that's come out about Mr. McMahon, sure. um, a lot of it seems a little creepy the way they objectified women at that time. And yeah, um, we'll have to see. And I don't want to date us too much in case this yeah. airs in a few weeks. I, I don't want to get too, too much ahead of the course, but we're going to be, of yeah. course, following the McMahon saga as we have. So you continue watching through the 2000s. I want to ask, because I went through this when I got married with kids and all that. I kind of stopped being able to watch week to week. Did you ever run into that when adult life took over or were you able to keep up with it every week? You think I was able to keep up with it. Um, you were. I was, I was fortunate that, you know, I, if I had something going on on a Monday night, I again would TiVo it, uh, yep. come home and, and, you know, fast forward through commercials and get, you know, at least get the gist of what I missed. Sure. So, yeah, I was I was fortunate in that aspect, you know, and as I grew up, though, there were some times that it was a little bit too ridiculous for me and I would, you know, sure. fast forward through it. So we've were, all been there. Times, yeah, there were times when it just uh, didn't, you know, didn't uh, affect me or I, I didn't really care for it. So, yeah. So tell I, me tell me about the content of the book and these fans you came across. If I understand right, you said it was telling of different stories of people you've met. Yes, sir. Um, so I. I had first written an article for uh, my website about four years earlier for a tattoo artist in Washington, Missouri named Kyle Scarborough. And Kyle had designed a mask for a wrestler named Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt showed yeah. up at SummerSlam as a new character named The Fiend. Mm -hmm. He wore this crazy, scary mask and he had this lantern. And well, Kyle designed all of this. And when I found out about that, I wrote this article for the website. And uh, fast forward four years later, I started thinking about that. And I'm like, man, that would be a great part for a book. So I went ahead and uh, kind of updated it. And then I decided, you know what? I want to go ahead and find some other people. So I found a gentleman named Justin Deming, who uh, was a huge wrestling fan, so much so that he 
contacted WWE and got the exact measurements of their wing title belt and had it really? tattooed on his waist. And you're able to get that from them? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it took two and a half years. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, um, then another gentleman I found. Hang on, was... back up. Is winged Hogan's belt? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. That was Just making sure. Belt. Yes, sir. Gotcha. Um, then I found a gentleman named John Gray, who was a referee uh, for a company called GCW, which is Game Changer Wrestling. Mm-hmm. And they are well known for what they call death matches. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit more extreme and uh, sure. crazy. But John is a great guy. And I basically told his story about how he met his wife uh, in a wrestling ring and they actually got married in a wrestling ring. Um, So I told his story. And then another individual who I talked to uh, was Izzy Moreno. Uh, She's from Florida and Uh she's a young girl that I first heard about uh, probably about 10 years earlier. She would call into this wrestling show called Busted Open that I listened to. Oh, yeah. Busted Open. That's um, with Bubba Ray. Bully yes, Ray, sir. I guess you yes, could see. Bully Ray. Yes. Yeah, they're they're one of the best in the business. Yes. Yep. yes, they are. And she would call in and she would know more about wrestling than most of the fans. Mm-hmm. And um, when I found out she wanted to be a, a pro wrestler, I started following her journey. And I'm like, this would be a great story because this is a 16 year old girl who, since she was seven, eight years old, wanted to be a pro wrestler. And now she's living out her dream traveling back and forth by herself to San Antonio, Texas to train. And um, she has since, I think, wrestled in four or five pro matches. And uh, that's her dream to work for WWE or AEW one day. Okay. And then uh, let's see another gentleman I talked to. His name was Derek and uh, Derek has a following of 3 million people on social media. Okay. He is a young man in St. Louis, um, and he is a big advocate for Down syndrome and um, children, you know, kids and young young adults with disabilities. And uh, biggest wrestling fan I've ever met. So him and his sister run this uh, site called Baker Banter, where they make video content. And so you can go on YouTube and see all these videos of Derek meeting all the superstars: John Cena, CM Punk, Cody Rhodes. And he is just a ray of light. Um, I was in Detroit covering SummerSlam this summer, and Derek was there with his family. And there's literally a line of 30 people deep to meet Derek. It was unreal. I want to get your opinion on something, and and what you're wearing right now makes me think of it. So wrestling fans seem unique to me. I mean, you probably deal with a lot of KC fans and NBAS fans. There's nothing like wrestling fans. They yeah. they are their own their own subculture almost. Yes. They Why are. are they so passionate? You know, I think it is for me, and it was kind of funny because my wife always jokes. She says, "You know, you have a you have a doctorate, and you watch this crap." And I'm like, <laughs> "I love you. I, I, I'm right there with you." Yeah. You know. Um. You know. But I think it's because it's an outlet for us. I think that, you know, wrestling is a form of entertainment, just like sports. Mm -hmm. I go to a Chiefs game, you know, tomorrow I'll be watching the Super Bowl, standing up, cheering, yelling. I do the same thing at a pro wrestling match. They're no different, you know. Um, One is scripted. Some may argue the other might be scripted. I don't think it is. But, you know, one is scripted. But we as fans can have a voice into what happens. If we keep, you know, like we just saw with The Rock and Cody Rhodes, if we keep voicing our opinions loud enough and we yell and stomp and go on the Internet and and let our voices be heard, we can make a change into what we're going to see. I want to get your opinion on that because that's interesting. So, like, if Hulk Hogan's beat up by Earthquake and it's 1989, Mm -hmm. we didn't have a say. I mean, we may cheer or boo and – you know, Vince and whoever might be sitting in the stands judging that, but now it's just totally different. We're, right. we're really part of the show. Yeah. Um, do you think that's positive or negative as far as, 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 as our, our input on the show? Because when we were watching in the golden era, it was given to us and we liked it, but now with social media and the advent of it, we're, you know, we're as much a part of the show as anything. I mean, the we're impacting you know possibly rock and cody 
other storylines, how AEW is booked. Whereas 30 years ago, we weren't, you know, whoever the Hulkster faced is who we got. Like the one that comes to mind is um, you may remember when Hogan at WrestleMania 93 comes in and gets the win over Yokozuna instead of Bret Hart. And if that had happened today, the social media outrage would have been huge. But yep. back then it wasn't. It's just what we got. What do you think about the difference? Do you think it's been positive that wrestling fans can really influence things? Whereas, you know, back in the day, we just kind of had to watch it. I think it works both ways. Um, you know, social media can be very, very good for pro wrestling. I think it it gives us, one, it gives us an insight into the athletes themselves uh-huh. uh, who have their own social media, you know, accounts and such. We can interact with them in a way that we were never able to interact with Hulk Hogan years ago. You know, for instance, when you saw Hulk Hogan at a wrestling match, he was Hulk Hogan. Uh, But then away from the ring, he was Terry Bollea. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we know that difference. A lot of people back then, I don't think did. I mean, as a kid, I didn't. I always thought, oh, Hulk Hogan's Hulk Hogan. I didn't know he was Terry Bollea, Terry Bollea with a wife and two kids. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it can be a negative, though, in the fact that there is a lot of hate spread on social media. For instance, yeah. you know, with with what the WWE was just dealing with, with The Rock and Cody Rhodes, um, The Rock came out to huge cheers. Mm-hmm. But then when the fans found out that Cody Rhodes wasn't going to get to finish his story, they flipped the script and they started hating The Rock, which... The, uh, an evil rock is good. You know, we enjoy an evil rock. Yeah, we're, we're excited about that. Actually, yes. I'm, I'm personally looking forward to that. Yeah, I am too. But you know, social media also allowed some of the fans that take it too far to send death threats to his daughter. Mm-hmm. And that is uncalled for. Um, sure. the, to me, those are not fans. Those are psychotic people who, yeah. who need to find something better to do with their time. Um, yeah. or maybe need some help. Yeah. Uh, you know, so It works both ways. And I think also it can hurt the, you know, part of being a wrestling fan is being surprised, not knowing what's going to happen. And with social media and the internet, you can go on and find, you know, leaks uh, of information. Uh, For instance, you know, who might show up at Mm -hmm. WrestleMania or who's going to show up on AEW in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I think that's already kind of been leaked we we all know there's a, a new superstar coming in March to AEW, and they kind of already AEW itself kind of leaked it because it's already been out. Because you know, when Lex Luger shows up on Monday Nitro, I didn't know it was going to happen. That was nowadays exciting. We would know. You know, it's yeah. it's hard to keep that a secret. And you know, I'll, I'll I'll say recently the WWE did a great job of shocking everyone with having CM Punk come back at Survivor Series in November. Sure. We all thought it might happen, but then we're like. With the 10 years he's away, the things that he said about WWE, the hatred he showed, there's no way he's showing up. And they waited till the very, very end. And then the roof blew off that place because everyone was, I mean, I was, I was sitting in my chair and I'm like, I was shocked because I was thinking, I'm like, he's not coming. And the way they booked it where it looked like the show was over and they're like, one more thing. It was brilliant. That was brilliant. So, you know, it can work both ways. Um, I wish that there was a little bit less information leaked on the internet. I like, I personally sometimes find it hard to um, watch the product sometimes because I know what's going to happen because I found out. I don't usually want to know. So like if it's a big show, I will put my phone away for that day. I'll stay off Facebook. I'll stay off Twitter. You know, um, I won't talk to anybody because I want to be surprised. That's one of the greatest parts of pro wrestling is the, the surprise and the reaction from the crowd. Well, tell me all about where people can find the book if they want to learn more about it, where they can buy it, all that good stuff. So you can go to my website, jeremyhousewright.com, and order it there. You can either order it from Amazon or you can order it straight directly from me. I'll sign it and ship it to you myself. And then uh, if you don't want to do either one of those two, you can go to barnesandnoble.com and order it from there. So. Do you have the author bug? I mean, you say this is your first book. Do you think you might do another down the road? I will tell you right now, I've already started work on a follow-up. Um, I've interviewed three individuals already. One, And I, what's cool about this next one is I'm going to be going over to the UK to interview people. 
So, oh, very fun. Um, I've already got three interviews in the can, and uh, it's the work has begun. That makes me think. I, I just I wanted to get your opinion. I've always wanted to ask someone about this. I had Hacksaw Jim Duggan on the show uh, a few months back, and Hacksaw was saying to me, "I'm more famous than Tom Brady." And I'm like, how is that possible? He's like, because Tom Brady wouldn't be known if he walked the streets in Australia. Hacksaw Jim Duggan would. Yeah. Do you think wrestlers are some of the unique forms of entertainment where they're known everywhere that a lot, you know, we maybe take for granted how famous they are compared to some of our, like, you know, a Patrick Mahomes or a Travis Kelsey. You're wearing a Chiefs jersey right now. We think they're the most famous of all time, but they're not as known in the Middle East like right. pro wrestlers are. Absolutely. Um you know, you look at somebody like John Cena, who, or even The Rock. I, I, yeah, I use The Rock sure. as a perfect. Look at his followers in social media. I mean, it's it's unreal. I mean, guys like The Rock, John Cena, Hogan, uh, they go anywhere in the world, and people know them. You know, and that's what's that's to me is what special is special about it because um, I think at some point or another, a lot of us worry their fans or are still fans, and we can relate to one another. Whereas NFL fans, I leave the United States, it's a little bit harder to find another Kansas City Chiefs fans. I mean, they can be found. Don't get me wrong. The NFL is doing a great job of expanding. Sure. But sure. with pro wrestling, I can go to you know um, Saudi Arabia, and they're just as rabid fans there as there are here in the United States. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a global product. Well, Jeremy Housewright, author of For the Love of the Show. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much. So, so happy to have Jeremy Housewright on, an author uh, for The Love of the Show. Pro wrestling fans tell their stories. You can look it up on Amazon right now is where I'm looking at it right here online. It's not hard to find a uh, great read out there. You might want to check it out. I also want to thank our other guests from the New York Post, uh, Joseph Tchesky, coming on, talking to us about that AEW free agency versus WWE, and, of course, the Macho Men. Macho men from all over North America finally get together on camera for the first time right here on Going Ringside. Share it wherever you can. We're trying to get the word out still about Going Ringside. Uh, of course, you can give us a follow at TikTok and Instagram at, at Going Ringside. But such a fun show today. Glad you could be with us. We'll see you back here next week. This has been Going Ringside with The Local Station, brought to you every Wednesday on your favorite podcast player, on New Sport Jacks Plus, as well as the New Sport Jacks YouTube channel.